Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Once again, we have this opportunity to relax and sit back and listen to how the Holy Spirit has touched someone. And often my guests come short distances. Often they come from a belief in Jesus as a non-Catholic to belief in Jesus as a Catholic. And well, in some ways that's still a long journey, but for some it's not quite so long. But then I have my guests that come from no belief in God to all the way to the home to the church. And that's what's happening tonight in our, our guest, Dr. Jennifer Frey. Welcome to thanks. the program. Dr. Yeah, thanks Jennifer. for having me. Jennifer, it's good to have you here. I'm really excited to be here. And former atheist, associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina, and I kind of heard through the, the, the works here that uh, y your other half is also a philosophy professor at yes. the same school, right? Yes, my husband is a philosopher. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. That's good to, to have you here. And uh, you also have a podcast called Sacred and Profane Love, right? Yes, I do. It's a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast. Okay, awesome. So, yeah. Well, maybe in the second half of the program, we can hear more about that. Sure. All right. Okay, good. Well, let's let's pause a bit, and I'll back off and invite you to start us on the journey, if you would. Yeah, well, so I actually am from Ohio. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from Cincinnati. Well, I'm actually just north of Cincinnati. I don't know how well you know the area, but I'm from Hamilton, Ohio. Oh, yes. Yes, and um, my dad worked in one of the two main paper mills in Hamilton, Champion Paper, which okay. of course no longer exists, along with the other <laughs> paper mill and also probably every <laughs> other manufacturing job in <laughs> Hamilton uh, is now gone. But uh, growing up in the 80s, um, Hamilton was still a manufacturing town, so quite different from it is now. And, um, you know, we were just a very, I mean, I was a nun in the demographic sense, hmm. N-O-N-E, so yeah. no religion. Parents, um, nothing? No, my parents were... Um, I'm not even sure if my parents were baptized. I was thinking about really? that on well, the way here. Um, I'm not sure. I should ask them. But no, my parents explicitly rejected Christianity. Hmm. So, and for different reasons. So my mother grew up in dysfunctional poverty and there was a lot of fundamentalist Christianity hmm. centered around that. So from my mother's perspective, Christianity was associated with ignorance, racism, yeah. um, and, and, and c kind of like a hillbilly um, <clears throat> way of thinking about things that she desperately wanted to move away from. Hmm. Um, so my mom left the house when she was 16 and got married because um, she wanted to get away from that. And she married my father, um, who at the time was a radio DJ <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, in Hamilton. Um, and my dad just grew up kind of nominally Methodist. So, you know, what, whatever kind of waspy cultural inheritance uh -huh. that would have given him. My, my dad's dad was an Italian immigrant. Hmm. And so my great-grandfather, Guido Bullio, um, would have been Catholic, would have been baptized Catholic. Um, in fact, I know the church that he would have been baptized in, in <laughs> Italy. Um, but when he came to the U.S., he was one of the Catholics who ended up in the coal mines in West Virginia. And I think he just lost yeah. the faith, lost uh, the practice of the faith. Um, there probably weren't that many Catholics around. Um, but I also think that was a very hard scrabble kind of life. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah, so so my dad had like a funny Italian name, but he really had no mm. Italian heritage, mm. um, either religiously or or otherwise. Um, so he grew up nominally Methodist. And um, I think like a lot of boomers, he was extremely um, suspicious of authority. And so any kind of organized religion where they're telling you what to believe and what to do was, was kind of antithetical to the zeitgeist. Yeah. <laughs> so he, um, he, he very much rejected organized religion. I also think, you know, remember, like, this is 
when I'm when I'm a kid, it's it's the '80s. I think he had a very strong association between organized religion and political conservative conservatism, and he was a union guy. Um, you know, he he was a union guy, a blue collar worker, and and so I think that was part of it too. Is he saw it as against his politics. Um, so with with no, two parents that. Uh, seemed to me not only didn't say anything, but maybe had a negative view of faith. And here you are in philosophy. Yes. Did, did your parents have a philosophy of life that you picked up young? Now, how did they, if there's no God, did they have a philosophy of life that they would have conveyed to you? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I mean, they had a political vision, which was definitely communicated to me at a very early age. And that was pretty liberal. Um, although it was a different kind now, right? So yeah. it's it's not the kind of political progressivism that we see now. Yeah. It was a just sort of uh, good old fashioned <laughs> kind of moral relativism, maybe just uh, an old fashioned liberalism that would take it that, you know, it's the responsibility of government to take care of people um, and meet their needs. Um, strong, strong, we need strong unions, we need strong public education, a k mm. kind of FDR okay. sort of yeah. democratic vision, I think that they, they were very strongly tied to. And so that was communicated to me very early. Mm. Um, politics was very important in my family. Um, and of course, we were very much against the grain because this is Reaganism. And everybody, you know, the social world was very different from my household because the social world where I grew up was very religious, very evangelical, um, and also very um, invested in Reaganism. And then in my home, there's no religion and Ronald Reagan is, a, <laughs> you know, yeah. not someone that I was meant to admire. So it was interesting growing up. I, I knew that, that we were different in a, in a lot of respects. Um, but, you know, my, my parents, it was, a, it was like a loving, a loving home, um, mm -hmm. loving, supportive home. Just there was no, there was no God. And um, it was also, I mean, it's true that my parents had a, a somewhat negative view of religion based on their personal experience but they were very tolerant people. Mm. And I think that was part of their political vision. You know, mm. they, they really thought that tolerance um, and civility were very important. So they would always say to me, like, we don't do that, we don't believe in that, but it's really important to other people and you need to respect them. Yeah, yeah. The golden rule is not just a Christian thing. Right. It's our conscience. Right. I mean, if you want to live together as a group of people, whether you believe in God or not, it comes down to you do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And there's right. a, you know, that's kind of the, the way you live together. Right. And there were aspects of the Christian vision of morality that my parents were invested in. Yeah. For example, unconditional love and forgiveness, care for the poor, um, this, this kind of post-Christian secular philosophy that has a lot of Christian elements yeah. in it. Um, so there was a lot of post-Christian secular politics, but no Christ. Yeah. <laughs> That's how right. I would think about it now. Yeah. All right. Our guest is Dr. Jennifer Frey. Uh, how long did this last? I mean, was this into high school? So, Well, so in high school, I became um, a, a more serious atheist. <laughs> Right. So I would say growing up, it just was like, we don't practice a religion. We don't talk about God. But that is that you could kind of describe as agnostic or or indifferentism right. is maybe a way of characterizing it. But in high school, I started to actually think about whether or not I believed in God. And I decided I, I definitely did not. Huh. <laughs> So, so in high school, I, you know, if somebody had asked me, I would just say, like, I'm an atheist. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't like a huge part of my identity. You know, I, I wasn't like a, like a new atheist. And I definitely wasn't a bully about it. But, but I was an atheist, a, a pretty committed atheist. And I was trying to think through what that meant for me. Because in a, as you said, in a, in a culture in that part of Ohio, where a majority of the people around you might have been at least nominal Christian, if not 
evangelical Christian. Right, they were. Were you, were you a bit ostracized at all in the midst of that because of your anti- No, <laughs> no, okay. I mean, the, the funny thing is when I reflect back on this experience, there really were almost no social consequences of being mm. an atheist, huh. right? So I was very popular um, you, you know, I, I mean, the one social consequence is just that the really committed evangelicals were invested in me in ways that were annoying. So they would be like, they would constantly be like, you got to be saved. And I would be like, I'm good. I'm really good. You know, and of course they don't back off, but, um, and we would just tease one another about it. Um, but no, there were, there really were no major social consequences. I mean, every once in a while there would be an awkward conversation with parents, um, but as a teenager, you you don't really care, <laughs> right? What the grownups think so much. It's more about your social sphere. So no, I'm, and I would also say that um, even though it's true demographically that the majority of people around me were evangelical, I would say that they were examples of what sociologists call moral therapeutic deism, mm -hmm. right? So that so this this kind of Christianity as self-help, you know, yeah. where it really, it doesn't demand anything of you. It doesn't even demand that you go to church. Um, but it's just like, it's like Jesus is my best friend and he's always there for me no matter what I do. It's that kind of thing. And I, I frankly could not take that seriously. I was like, that's not, that's not serious. I mean, were, were you at that time that you'd moved into a, a, a serious atheism? Uh, making the direct connects in terms of, well, there is no God and there is no purpose, you know, and that kind of, there's no beginning, there's no end. I remember reading not long ago the, the statement of an old man just before he died and he said, I'm, you know, I don't know where we came from, I don't know where we're going, all I know is when I die I'm just going to become fertilizer to replenish the earth for the bad I've done to her, you know, I mean, were you making those direct connects? No, I never believed that. Um, I always had a very strong sense of morality, so right and wrong. And I believed that, and that was actually one of the things that really turned me off mm -hmm. about Christians, is that um, it didn't seem to matter to them whether or not they did really bad things. They were saved. And I just thought, that's crazy. I mean, if you murder someone, you've wronged them, and you're guilty. And that should have a very, that should bear a kind of significance. Mm. Um, and so I thought it was preposterous that hell would be filled with people like me just because I hadn't been saved and it would, you know, like there would be all these murders in heaven. And, uh, so, so I just thought, well, this, this just fundamentally makes, oh, that, makes no sense. That's um, fascinating. so I didn't think because there's no God, I can do whatever I want. Um, I would say that the most important value to me at that age was something like integrity, something like personal integrity, like um, you have to live in accordance with what you believe and um, you, you have to be faithful to whatever your vision is. Um, yeah. and, and I thought there were strong moral constraints, especially constraints of justice. Um, my parents did have a strong sense of social justice that was instilled in me. I remember asking a, a, an atheist in the 16th century, which figure would that person admire? I was trying to get him, mm -hmm. the reformers, and he said Thomas More. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, why Thomas More? Because he was willing to die for conscience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was willing to die for conscience. Yeah. That's that integrity you're talking about. Yeah. But I, it's also fascinating to think about an audience, I think this is important to pick up on. It's not just you were an atheist versus Christianity. You were atheist in the context of a specific thread of Christianity yeah. that had this idea that once saved, always saved. I therefore can kind of live my life. Well, that was shaping your atheism. I'm not going to be that. If that's Christianity, I want nothing to do with that. That's right. I mean, that, that in itself is, I think, fascinating. If we have more time to explore on that. So there you are in high school, uh, a flaming <laughs> atheist. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know. I don't know how flaming I was. I don't know. Well, those I don't... evangelicals were sure you were flaming. Yeah. Well, I... where they thought, assumed you were heading. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I was pretty committed and I wanted to be, by, by the end of high school, I wanted to be an intellectually serious person. Um, it took me a little while to get there, but once I was there, uh, I, I, I stayed there. Um, and so I wanted, um, I wanted things to make sense and I had a really strong appetite for knowledge, mm-hmm. you know, and, um, and that also kind of set me apart from, from a lot of other people in high school. Um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to understand things. And I think part of that was because I was an atheist, you know, everybody else kind of had a story that was given to them and I didn't have a story. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, by the time I really started thinking about things, I realized there's a lot that I don't understand Hmm. on some very general level, Hmm. um, which of course led me into philosophy pretty. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when I got to college, I was really disappointed because, um, I don't know, you, you, I, I at least for whatever reason, had this idea of college as a very serious thing. And I got there and it was just like high school (laughs) in so many ways. Um, And I was done with high school. I was done with high school when I was still in high school. Um, And and I really wanted to learn. And so what happened was I kind of fell in with the graduate students. Um, I couldn't really connect with other undergrads who were still just interested in going to parties and oh, right. and all this kind of stuff. I know, and I did all that in high school. I'm like, I've done all that. I'm, I'm ready to do something else now. <laughs> and, um, and and they were not ready. So, so I started hanging out with a lot of graduate students, particularly philosophy graduate students. And I just had this voracious appetite for what I didn't know at the time, but you know, now I can articulate and say I had a voracious appetite for philosophical knowledge, you know, the kind that Newman speaks about in the idea of the university. And um, yeah, I, I just spent all this time in study. And one thing that really changed for me was that my first philosophy professor was very religious. So it was a really interesting, um, at the time I saw it as a contradiction, Um, but he was simultaneously the smartest, most sophisticated uh, person that I had ever met. You know, his degrees were from Balliol College, College, Oxford and Harvard, and he was British. Um, Just this incredible intellectual and social pedigree. Um, but he was also the most religious person I had ever met. He was an Orthodox Jew, so he kept the Sabbath, he kept kosher, he set aside time to be holy, to, to be set apart. And I couldn't understand how these two things had converged, right? I was just like, and so I remember, you know, asking him, because we eventually became very close friends, um, I, but I remember going to him and being like, so like this Jewish thing, you know, that's like cultural. That's because like the Holocaust, <laughs> like, you know, like, like, like it's really important to you now to, to have this cultural thing. And he was like, well, I, I believe in God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, like it's not just, I mean, yes, there is a cultural element to it, but I believe in God. And this was, um, I don't know. I mean, this sort of like opened up space for me to see that you can be religious and intellectually serious, which is something that I honestly thought was impossible. And then did, just did, in, did he engage you in the in any of the arguments for God at that point, or was it just the just the fact that he's a philosopher? Just the fact. And he um, God. Just yep. the fact. I mean, I was so it's really hard for me to uh, overstate how impressed I was with uh-huh. my philosophy professor. And, um, and, and just how alien the, the whole thing was to me. Huh. And so it opened up a certain conceptual space for me that like, this is a path. And then once you notice something, you can't unnotice it, <laughs> right? right? And so then I start to see that there are, there's actually more than one intellectually serious hmm. religious person in the world. There are in fact many. Um, but another game changer for me was, um, so, so my first philosophy class was existentialism and we did read Kierkegaard by the way, (laughs) um, which, which was fantastic. I, I love Kierkegaard. Um, but a lot of the existentialist philosophy, um, really made no sense to me. Hmm. Like I was like, this is not 
this is not right. You know, um, this kind of solipsistic, uh, self-determinative um, idea of the human person is entirely self-created. I'm like, I, I don't think this is, I don't think this is right. You know, this doesn't feel true to experience. There seems like something really off about it and I couldn't articulate it. But my next class was medieval philosophy, which is a complete 180. You know, it's the exact opposite. And we're reading Boethius and we're reading Anselm and we're reading Aquinas. And, um, you know, I mean, what happened is, you know, I was 18 and, and I absolutely fell in love with Thomas Aquinas. I just was like, this makes sense. You know, this makes sense on a, on a metaphysical level. This makes sense to me. This makes sense to me morally, you know, the, the concept of natural law and the role that conscience plays in natural law and the idea that just in living according to the principles of our own nature, we participate in the divine law. And so it's not this kind of brute voluntarism. It's not, right? It is... Like in fulfilling my nature is the kind of thing that I am. I am obeying God's law. That was um, a completely new way of thinking, well, yeah. right? And it made sense to me. Um, I was like, well, that makes sense. Now, I still didn't believe in God. <laughs> yeah, I was <laughs> so, going to say you're making a comparison between what's in here right. to this divine as opposed to what's in here is the collective thinking of ages. Right. As a horizontal thing. All of a That's sudden right. you've got the vertical thing here that you don't have a place for that. That's right. That's right. And so there was this immediate contrast between the existentialist conception of freedom and then the Christian conception of freedom. Um, I didn't mention Augustine, but we read Augustine's De Libero Arbitrio, which is his um, little, little treatise on free choice. And I was like, no, that's a conception of freedom that makes that makes yeah. sense of me, that um, that seems that seems much much better than what I had been studying the previous mm -hmm. semester, um, and so I became really sort of obsessed with this question about whether or not you could rationally assent to the proposition that God exists and what would that mean, what sort of proposition is that, <laughs> um, and I sort of fell off a cliff really like studying this stuff. Um, I pretty much lived in the library as far as I could. And eventually what happened was I decided that you could rationally assent <laughs> to the proposition that God existed. But there was a big gap between that and Christianity because Christianity has the doctrine of the Trinity, which is complicated. <laughs> well, yeah. So you, your little step was into agnosticism? I mean, you were going, or just deism. In other words, there's a God. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't have said I was a deist, but because um, there's a lot of baggage that comes with yeah, that. Right. And there are a lot more commitments that come with that besides believing in God. Um, but I was beginning to take classical theism very seriously, hmm. right? Um, as an intellectual position that deserved respect and investigation, yeah. right? Um, that it could be true, hmm. um, which is a big leap, right? Oh. Because I realized like I was actually a very terrible atheist. You know, a good atheist <laughs> understands what she rejects. And I was not a good atheist because I didn't really understand okay. what I was rejecting. Um, I mean, what I was rejecting was a social cultural phenomenon that I grew up with, right? Which is, I think, what a lot of atheists are rejecting is a kind of social practice that they don't fit into and don't want to fit into. Um, but when you actually start to look at what classical theism says, right, um, it's something much more sophisticated. And yeah, so what happened at that point was I made a very serious, long study of the patristics. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and, and that was really a kind of autodidactic sort of thing. I mean, I was just reading it, um, simultaneously I was learning Latin, um, and cause I wanted to be able to read this stuff in the original, um, so you're reading the, the, the Christian patristics yeah. as opposed to Latin, Greek philosophies. And I mean, that was also happening probably. Was well, I'm still truth? doing that cause I'm a right. philosophy major. Right. 
Um, so I'm still reading Plato and Aristotle and, and uh, Cicero was really huge for me as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. I, I absolutely adored Cicero. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm reading the Antonicene Fathers and the Post-Nicene Fathers and the Nicene Fathers. Yeah. And, um, and, and that was, once you read those guys, um, there's no question about whether or not you're going to be a Protestant. It's just, am I going to be Catholic or Orthodox? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or not? Well, um, I mean, we're still at the, in, if I, as I'm hearing your journey, you're, you're starting to be awake to this, the reality of a vertical, you know, mm -hmm. that there's a God up there. And, uh, and it seems that before you get into the battle of whether you're Catholic or Orthodox, and as Newman says, you have you become deep in history. That Protestant thing just doesn't. No, hold. it's it's not it, even. It, I mean, it's not, it, yeah, there's nothing there in there. But it seems to me that before you even get to the Catholic and Orthodox thing, and maybe we'll take a break now uh, before, is this issue of creator creature. Yes, yes. I mean, that's a big deal. Yes, it's not just the not just God, but all of a sudden is a connected creator creature. Yes. And, and to me, that had to predate whether you were Orthodox or Catholic or not. Yeah. In your thinking. Yeah. So that's okay. So that's a really interesting way of framing it. Um, I mean, I think that at this point in my intellectual development, I wasn't as impressed by that as I should have been. Hmm. That was something that I came to be impressed with later on when I had more time to very seriously study Aquinas in particular, yeah. right? I mean, you, it, yeah, I'm, so, so I agree with that now. I'm not sure looking back at my 18 year old self that that's the way that I was okay. thinking about it. Okay. Um, yeah. But, Cause that's the reason I thought about that was when you think about the patristics and Augustine and all that, that issue of even Irenaeus, you know, creator and creature was such a big issue for, for their making that transition from the Greek philosophies into Christianity. It yes. seemed that that was such a yes. big So you were encountering that the yes. whole time. So that is a huge difference. I think for me at the time, um, I was trying to figure out how you could rationally ascend to the Trinity. Okay. Like that's what I, and, and, and the reason I went back to them is, they were the ones figuring this out in the beginning, you know? <laughs> and um, so that's the lens through which I was reading it. Okay. Um, yeah. Because you're struck with that number one foundational mystery. Of I was. Is and the I Trinity. Think, and, and I think part yeah. of that is because I was, I had a lot of Jewish friends. Okay. Uh, a lot yeah. of Jewish intellectual yeah. friends who were like, you know, that Trinity stuff, it's it it doesn't work, <laughs> no. um, yeah. and no. so I I had to take that seriously, right? Does yeah. it work? Um, well, yeah. There's one God, and Jesus is God. Right. How do I put those two together? That's right. How do you put those two together? Yeah. So, all right. Let's pause there. Okay. Okay. And we'll come back in a moment. And I do want to remind the audience: if you go to chnetwork.org, that's the website for the Coming Home Network International. Not only will you find more stories like Dr. Frey's, but you will find uh, information about our online community. If you have to be on the journey, you want to connect with somebody. If you're an atheist wondering, who are these crazy people believing that there's a, there's a creator up there? Well, you can get connected with other people on the journey. That's chnetwork.org. See you in a bit. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Dr. Jennifer Frey. And we're, I rudely interrupted her in the middle of your journey. <laughs> and, uh, but during the break, you mentioned a couple things that had also been important during this time that you thought would be good to bring up. Yeah, well, I mean, so I haven't talked about the Bible right, right. <laughs> at all. <laughs> so much, right? It's, so it's all been uh, theology and philosophy, uh, which makes sense because that's where I started. Um, but eventually, as I was taking um, Christianity, or just Orthodox Christianity in the big O sense, um, you know, I, I was like, obviously, I need to 
go back and, and really read the Bible with fresh eyes. Um, I had read bits of the Bible um, in your, high school. Your, your ph philosophy professor who was an Orthodox Jew hadn't encouraged you to at least look in the Old Testament? No. No, okay. No. Um, no, I, um, I, I'm, honestly, my original interest in the Bible came from my interest in art and literature. Mm -hmm. So I realized in high school that biblical ignorance and aesthetic appreciation of the Western tradition were not compatible. <laughs> and actually, the person that made me realize this the most was James Baldwin. You just cannot appreciate James Baldwin as a writer unless you know the Bible because it's so biblically infused. And I loved him as a writer. I just huh. thought he was incredible. Um, and so I had kind of started to read the Bible a little bit in high school, but not in a not in a serious way and certainly not in the way that I began to read it in college. And at any rate, you know, reading, um, reading the Bible... Um, kind of brought home to me, one, my attraction to Christ and the teachings of Christ, um, but also um, that reading the Bible poses a really stark question. You know, is Christ who he says he is? Because if he's not, I think it's pretty difficult to admire him. Um, if he's not who he says he is, then he looks like a crazy cult leader and a liar and someone who is manipulating people in, in pretty problematic ways. <laughs> so... Yeah, if anybody says, I want you to drop everything, give everything away and follow me. Yeah. <laughs> he also says he's the son of God, yeah. the son of man. He said, I mean, he says all of this stuff that if yeah. he's not who he says he is, he's yeah. a megalomaniacal crazy person. Yeah. And so I realized that my attraction to Christ was to... Christ, <laughs> right? <laughs> but but it ha I mean, if he's not the Messiah, then this attraction, there's something really, yeah. uh, something really weird about it. So, um, so, so that, you know, that, that obviously had a, had a huge impact for me. Um, and so I, I started to, um, I, I went to talk to the, to the local Catholic priest. So I'm in Southern Indiana. So I'm in Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. There are really not very many Catholics there. Well, at this point, no one other question though, before we get yeah. there um, yeah. is, okay, you, um, you've decided not Protestantism. You said that earlier. And you've accepted reality mm -hmm. of, okay. And then you like this Christ figure. Yeah. Have you had any connection with them yet? Have I prayed? Have you prayed? No. <laughs> no. I mean, here's the thing that I think is difficult for people to understand is when you grow up the way that I, I mean, so prayer is a habit, right? It's a habit of mind and heart and feeling. Yeah. And I did not have this habit, right? And for me, praying was like weird and um, it felt really inauthentic and so that was a huge, that was a huge, one, I didn't know how to pray, yeah. right? I mean, and any attempt that I made, it just felt silly. So anyway, so I went to talk to this Catholic priest and he did not know what to do with me. You know, he just was like, I mean, I was just like, oh, and Augustine and Irenaeus and Aquinas. And he's just like, and so finally he's like, um, have you been to mass? And I'm like, no. And he's like, I think you should go. <laughs> like, he's like, I think you should actually like go to a mass. You know? And he's like, because that's our form, our principal form of prayer. And I just think you should see that. He's like, you should not take communion. And I'm like, well, I know that. And, and he's like, okay. So I went to mass, you know, and it was an interesting experience because on the one hand, I was incredibly drawn to the mass because I understood intellectually what was happening. But on the other hand, I was like kind of repulsed because I thought nobody here seems to believe any of this because look at how they're acting. Like, look at like, this is all just meaningless to them because like nobody was reverent. Nobody seemed to care. You know, the confessional in this church was like converted to a coat closet. Like it was just clear that, mm -hmm. you know, there was a big disconnect between the teaching and the practice. Also, the church was like incredibly ugly. I mean, just so ugly. Was this one of these newer churches? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. okay. And the music was ugly. It just, I was kind of like, huh. 
Um, this isn't, you know, this isn't like the, you know, this isn't like a Gothic cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have this sense of transcendence. You know, like I know yeah. intellectually what's supposed to be happening, but it doesn't really seem to fit the reality of any of it. Um, and so it's it was... It's interesting to think of why in your journey that's the one that God brought you to first. You know yeah. what I mean? It's... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, he did not bring me to Notre Dame in Paris. <laughs> he brought me to this little ugly church. <laughs> and I mean, it's interesting to think back about that because... Um, you know, the other big obstacle for me and becoming Catholic, I mean, there were so many obstacles. One is I knew it was going to be a huge problem for my family and it was, mm -hmm. um, but two, it was so uncool. Like it was so uncool. It was the most dramatically uncool thing <laughs> that I could possibly do, especially amongst my circle of friends, you know, who are intellectuals. Um, you know, it's like, what are you doing? And, and I couldn't like take them into the church and be like, but see how beautiful it is. Cause it wasn't, or I couldn't yeah. take them to the mass and be like, see, isn't this transcendent? Cause it wasn't really. <laughs> and so it was a huge stumbling block for me. Um, and I still wasn't praying, like I said, uh, but then I, I finally, uh, got around to reading Augustine's confessions <laughs> and that book, I mean, basically when I put that book down. I knew that I had to get baptized. Um, but also in the middle of that book, I, you know, prayed for the first time in my life. And it was, um, it was like weird and sublime at the same time. I don't really know how to describe it. Um, but I felt called, I felt called to be baptized and I had never had that feeling before. Um, I wasn't terrifically excited about it, to be honest. <laughs> um, I, I was very ambivalent about it. Um, but I knew that when something like that happens to you, you can't just ignore it. Hmm. Um, and so I did get baptized, uh, about a year later, I went through RCIA, which was very difficult for me hmm. because I knew way more than the people teaching RCIA and that created some tensions. Because like they would say something and I'd be like, that's not true. <laughs> I mean, in terms of even you had come to know the theology. Oh, right? yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Well, the RCIA program, it was so watered down. Yeah. And, um, and, and I was looking for something robust. I mean, I was mm. like, if I'm going to change my life, it's not going to be for some watered down, you know, <laughs> but like this, this weak sauce watered down, everything's fine. I'm like, everything's not fine. That's why I'm here, you know? <laughs> um, and so RCIA was a stumbling block for me. Um, but I was committed, you know? I had had this experience. I was committed. I got through it and, and I was baptized. But, you know, my conversion story wasn't sort of like, oh, there was this one moment and all the scales fell from my eyes and, you know, now I'm a zealot or something. Um, I mean, one of the things that I really appreciated about St. Augustine is that he um, gives you a way of thinking about conversion as an ongoing drama throughout your life. Mm -hmm. Because at every moment in your life, you're either conversio, you're either turned towards God or you are turned away from him. And mm -hmm. so I knew that to start that, like I had to get baptized. I was never baptized. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and I, and, and by that point I, I knew that I wanted to be baptized a Roman Catholic, um, that I didn't want to be Orthodox. Um, and so you had, you had made that decision. Previously. I did. I had, I had made that decision through studying a lot of theology, but also, um, meeting with, um, go going to an Orthodox yeah. service and meeting Orthodox, yeah. um, people and, I, uh, you know, the, the ways that they tried to sell Orthodox Christianity on me were the things that pushed me into Catholicism. Um, one, oh. it's, you know, you have to pick a national church. I don't like the idea of national churches. Mm -hmm. I think Christianity really is Catholic. It's universal. Um, but also there is a kind of anti-intellectual strand within Orthodox um, theology, you know, so one of the things that they'll tell you about the West 
is that it's too rationalistic um, and that St. Augustine had the wrong view about uh, original sin. And I was just like, I love St. Augustine and I'm a philosopher. So this is not, <laughs> this is not drawing me in <laughs> at all. Um, but also I knew that uh, we had Catholic heritage, you know, I'm part Italian. Mm -hmm. And so, and, 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 I, and I knew, I knew the church where everyone in my family had been, had been baptized going back just a few generations. And so there was a, you know, a, a, a family thing as well. Um, so yeah, so, so I was baptized Catholic, but I think for me, that was really like just the beginning of something, yeah. you know, that I only vaguely understood at the time, but felt called to do in a really strong way. I almost feel looking back that the reason the Lord may have had your first experience of mass be in this not quite so appealing environment. Yeah. So that that wasn't a distraction. Yeah. You know, the if it had maybe been the most beautiful, that might have been a distraction from you cutting through that to say, oh, wait a second, what is this really all about? Yeah. I mean, I think that's pretty insightful because, um, I, you know, I've been Catholic almost all of my adult life at this point. Hmm. Um, I've been Catholic longer than I've been not Catholic at huh. this point. And, um, and of course, I know a lot of converts who have lost the faith. And a yep. lot of those converts who have lost the faith were, um, they, they came, they became Catholic in this incredible Catholic environment, right? Yep. And all of their friendships and their intellectual life, like it was all, it all made sense. And then at some point they moved away from that for whatever reason, and they lost the faith. For me, it was the exact opposite. Yep. You know, I was like really on my own, <laughs> um, just, just really trying to figure out if, if I was going to do this. And, and I was like, if I'm going to do this, like, I'm going to do this, yep. <laughs> you know? Yep. And... And there were a ton of obstacles, but again, at the end of the day, I felt called, and 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 here I am, and I'm still, uh, I'm still Catholic. Uh, it's interesting you said it the way you did, because yeah, there were a lot of. We think about the years of the journey home has been around twenty. We've been doing this program for twenty four years. We've been working the Coming Home Network now for, going on twenty nine years. The church has changed a lot in, twenty four twenty nine years. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean the church has changed, but at least our, our Catholic environment has changed and so much has changed. And I'm thinking a lot of the converts that I knew, 80s, 90s, during a John Paul II mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. that has changed. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those are the ones mm -hmm. that have backed away. Right. And maybe they hung their hat on, right. on the wrong thing. Yeah, they did. And they you didn't have that away. chance. The Lord said, <laughs> "Yeah, <laughs> start you from rock bottom." That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, I'm grateful for that. Um, you know, to be forged in that particular crucible. Something also struck me as a parallel is you talked about that philosopher that you really admired. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you knew him first as a philosopher. Yes. And then you realize, whoa, he believes in God. Yeah. That was your experience with Augustine. Yeah. I mean, in other words, it wasn't the confessions first. Right. And then the philosophy, it was him as a philosopher first. That's right. And then he believes in God. I mean, yeah. that, that, that's interesting the way, that's the way the Lord seems to have worked with you a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, Augustine is, is incredibly close to my heart um, because, you know, it, when I first studied um, Augustine, it was really just in a philosophical context. Um, but when you read the Confessions, it's the journey of a soul. Yeah. I mean, it's such a, I mean, Augustine just really put his humanity out there in such a deep way. And that's why, I mean, to this day, mm -hmm. it, it's hard for me to find someone who does not like that book if they've actually right. read it. Because he puts his humanity on the page. And that was so attractive to me because I read Augustine and I was like, that's me <laughs> in some <laughs> really deep sense. That's me, you know, and his, um, his struggles are, are my struggles, you know, and the only question is whether or not his solution is, is mine, yeah. is the solution, right? 
And, and so I think it's so interesting that it was really in reading that text that I felt called to be baptized. And, um, and of course, I had read tons of philosophy and theology and not felt that way at all. Hmm. Um, I felt curious. I felt drawn in. Um, but it was a guy, you know, so something about that book. Uh, you can't turn on the evening news uh, if you're unfortunate to do that. Uh, to turn on the evening news and see what's happening in our world. And one might argue that what's going on in our culture and in our world is a post-Christian time. Uh, but I'm wondering if it's a post-philosophy time, too. Oh, well, I think it is. Yeah. Talk about the importance of a good philosophy. I mean, yeah, uh, philosophy has definitely fallen on hard times because even in the academy, it's not valued anymore. Um and there are so many, so many reasons for that. Um, part of it is that we are no longer invested in liberal education, real liberal education. Right. Um, what we have entered a period um, where of this kind of self-righteous certainty hmm. um, that is resistant to liberal education and liberal learning. Um, and that I think is, is very toxic because both sides operate from a position of self-righteous certainty. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, uh, you will find it in our universities yeah. um, that, you know, there's, there's only one way to think about a range of issues that are so personal and so vast and so complicated that really are the issues that are the stuff of philosophy. You know, what is race? What is racism? What is sex? Yeah. What is gender? What is marriage? What is, um, you know, wh what is good government? Um, you know, increasingly, um, you're just not allowed to explore various aspects of this. Mm. And, um, and of course, that's the death of philosophy because philosophy is rooted in the natural desire to know and understand things. And it presupposes that you're allowed to ask difficult questions. Mm -hmm. It is completely against the idea that this is the way to think. I mean, read Plato, read Socrates. That's not how it works. Now, philosophy is oriented towards truth, right? That's, well, it's oriented towards wisdom, right? But how do you get there? The starting point is humility, not self-righteous certainty. So I feel, um, I feel culturally we've lost that, um, if we ever really had it in the United States, but we've definitely lost it now. And um, that's, a, that, that's a huge problem because philosophy changed my life, right? I entered philosophy from a position of supposed certainty, and I very quickly realized I don't understand much at all, it turns out. And that's the position that philosophy puts you into relatively quickly if you're doing it correctly. You realize like, oh my gosh, I don't know. And so if you operate from that space of humility, um, it's, it's actually very good. And it's not, I think a lot of Christians think wrongly that that's opposed to the faith. And that's because they have the incorrect understanding of the relationship between faith and reason. And the church, the Catholic church, I think has the right understanding of that. It, it seemed to me, as I look back on my own journey, that, and I don't mean this in any negative sense towards our separated brethren, but it seemed to me that from the Catholic perspective versus the Protestant perspective, the Catholic perspective is not to be afraid of the search for truth. That's right. To embrace it because yeah. That natural desire for knowledge, its perfection, is in the beatific vision, yeah. right? So of course we must cultivate that through study. And so it's not surprising that the university is a product of medieval Catholicism, mm -hmm. which it is. Yeah, but the, the modern universities have lost track of their heritage. Well, I mean, they've ex pretty explicitly rejected it. Yep. Yeah, I wouldn't yep. even say they've lost track. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have an email. Let's see if we can take get this in. Um, Allison from Missouri writes, I was raised 
Baptist, and I've heard more than one sermon saying we should stay away from the studying philosophy because of what St. Paul says in Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. That's King James Version. Help uh, me understand how studying philosophy can build a Christian's faith. Because all I've ever heard about it, it is how studying philosophy is a way to lose your Christian faith. Yeah, that's a great question. So thank you. Um, I mean, I think we just look at the history of the church, right? And we, I mean, if you look at the history of the Western tradition, right, we have two streams that start to form a single, right, river. So you have the Socratic tradition of Athens, and you have the prophetic biblical tradition, right? And they converge, right, at a very particular point early on. Mm -hmm. And Christian theology was always born out of the interaction. So we talked about it in the break, say Justin Martyr. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the earliest patristics, right? I mean, he's, he's talking to the emperor about Plato and mm -hmm. about how Platonism and Christianity are compatible. So it was always there from the beginning in our tradition. And I think that, um, you know, there is a difference between good and bad philosophy, just as much as there is a difference between good and bad theology. And I think that there are bad ways of doing philosophy and approaching philosophy that you might find in a university, I'm not going to lie, that would be deleterious to the faith. But there is good philosophy and good ways of doing philosophy that are grounded in the classical texts of philosophy that are quite helpful because they force you, or rather they encourage you, I would say, to think about ultimate questions of metaphysics and value. And if you understand the relationship between faith and reason properly, then you will know that nothing reason teaches you will be contradicted by your faith. Right? Faith is a higher kind of revealed knowledge, right? It's God revealing himself to us. But what we can know through reason, right, isn't going to contradict that. Um, and so if you run into problems at the level of reason, right, you know that you need to work through those in light of your faith. And, um, and of course, there are exemplars of doing this. Um, you know, the, 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 the long tradition of Catholic philosophers, uh, you know, is, 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 it pre presents us an exemplar, right, to imitate and to look to, right, for how to have an integrated life of faith and reason. But it's incredibly important for your faith because we live in a culture that not only can you not take for granted right? What Christianity teaches, but we live in a culture that is absolutely opposed to it. And so if you cannot argue with people on the level of philosophy and reason, you, you've got nowhere to go mm -hmm. because they do not see the Bible as a source of knowledge. So if all you can do is quote the Bible, yeah. game is over. Yeah, it seems that that was one of the, the desires of Justin Martyr and the early patristics is that here you have this Jewish tradition bringing with them a Bible. That's right. That's right. And then the Gentiles are saying, well, what, what do we have? Did God never speak to us at all? And then for them saying, well, wait they a second. They have the sages. We do have a, we, we, we do have a heritage. Mm -hmm. We do have a heritage. And so that's why, you know, looking at, at Aristotle and Plato. Mm -hmm. But then at some point you realize, well, does that mean we just accept everything they pass along or do we have to sift through that to see right. see what the baggage was? And so right. that was Augustine and Aquinas well, of sifting course, through that. And the pagans have religion. They do have religion. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And their religion also centrally involves the concept of sacrifice. We've got a minute left, Dr. Frey. Uh, we didn't have a lot... Talk a bit of, really quickly about your website. Is somebody connected on your on your YouTube channel? Uh, yeah, so I don't have a YouTube channel. Sorry to disappoint. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a podcast, podcast. Um, called Sacred and Profane Love. It's a philosophy, theology, and literature podcast. Sort of the conceit is that part of what it means to live well is to read well and study well. So we have conversations on my podcast um, that try to model intellectual friendship, intellectual joy, right? The life of the mind. Mm -hmm. 
um, for anyone. So if you uh, want to join in with that conversation, you can um, you can download the podcast anywhere. You would download any podcast. It's on all the platforms, but it's hosted at thevirtueblog.com, um, which was a blog uh, that predated the podcast, but then just sort of absorbed it. So, yeah. All right, Dr. Jennifer. Thank you very much for, yeah, absolutely. for joining us on the program. And uh, Thanks for having me. And all of you, thank you once again for joining us on the journey home. I do pray that Dr. Frey's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.